1849, a cholera-stricken Darlington needed help. The water was undrinkable and deadly. Thankfully, with funding from the Pease family, the Tees Cottage pumping station was born. This wonderful site cleansed and pumped fresh drinkable water to Darlington and Teesside, saving the lives of thousands. After 130 years of continuous dedicated service, the last pumps were wound down and put to bed. Fortunately, the fabulous Tees Cottage Pumping Station Preservation Society was formed in 1980 to save this historic place for posterity. Due to their hard, dedicated work, the station is still open in 2024 for the public to enjoy and marvel at, thrilling the hundreds of visitors they get every year. In this film, our host, James Evans, who himself has been a volunteer since he was nine in 2016, will show you around this historic site, but through the eyes of the volunteers. We'll meet the volunteers and find out why they do what they do. Come aboard for a steam-packed journey as we explore Tees Cottage Pumping Station, 175 years and counting. The site opened in 1849. It was the first pumping station in the Tees Valley. It had then a fairly small beam engine, which was adequate for the job. And remember the need for a pumping station and for an incredible um, beam engine like this. Cholera struck Darlington in 1831. So it was a very real medical crisis and one that engine like this, purifying the water, helped to eradicate. And that was a draw to, for a number of people who were joining the working community in Darlington in the mid 19th century, come to Darlington work, you've got pure, you've got clean water. As indeed the fountains in the town. Recently reading a novel that actually featured one of the fountains by the market square. And I thought, my goodness, there you are. It was and the engineers were taking in turns to go down and service them and make sure they were working. If they weren't working properly, well, they were soon told, get down there and sort it out, which they did. Over the years as Darlington grew and, and demand for water increased, then they modified the engine, they then put new engines in, until eventually when it got to about 1900, they had to think about the future demand and satisfying that, and they realised that the present equipment wasn't up to the job. So, this thing was built. along with a new set of boilers. This was actually built, constructed by the Teesdale Brothers, assembled in Darlington Nisham Road, and designed originally by Glenfield Ken and Kennedy of Kilmarnock. That was way back in 1904. The beam engine went into use in 1904, and it worked until 1926 when a set of electric pumps were installed. That wasn't the end of it, however. They carried on with the engine as standby plant and ran it for a fortnight in every year to keep, make sure everything was all right. That went on until the mid 1950s when it was shut down. In 1975, it was run again to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Stockton and Darlington Railway. Then, I suspect, they thought it would never run again. Then we came along. Uh, we spent lots of time taking barrel load of barrel load of soot out of the boiler, 
cleaning the engine, oiling it, adjusting things. And it ran again in, I think it was November 1981. I joined in January 1982 when they ran it again. And it's run reliably four or five times a year ever since. Well, almost reliably. And um, when it's actually in full beam operational mode, it is just a delight to be part of it and to see the synchronisation still good and true in 2024. How fantastic is that? And that's a testimony to our engineers, our volunteer engineers and others, who do all that oiling, valving, of filling with oil and so on. And people like James who come along, give their time. Um, and growing expertise, growing skills. A lot of, there are lots of beam engines around in the country but the pumps have been disconnected, so they're just basically idling. This thing, when it's running, is pumping 3,800 gallons of water a minute. That's 19,000 litres a minute. The water goes into the filter beds outside and then tails off back into the river, but the engine is doing a fair bit of work. The second thing is, it was one of the last beam engines to, to be built in this country. Now, they could have put in a gas engine, they could have put in a set of electric pumps, and yet they went for a beam engine. Why? Several reasons. The main one was that the guys here knew about steam, and so training wouldn't be a problem. And secondly, they could rely on steam. And, well, they were proved right there, weren't they? You've also got, I think, to have your own oneness with and realise why you want to be here. And it's nothing to do with um, um, a grand cosmetic setup. As you look round, we're talking about an authentic building with authentic plaster coming off the wall here and there, and authentic leads of this mighty, sometimes referred to as a beast, Brad on Sea as a beast. I think she's got a great gentleness as well. The one particular council, councillor, was not very happy with the situation and um, said, well, if you're going to put a beam engine in, it's got to be state of the art. It's got to have everything on it that will make it efficient. So that's what they did. So this beam engine represents the state of the art for beam engines in this country. They never got any better than this. Uh, the gas engine was manufactured by Richard Hornsby and company uh, and installed with its pumps and ancillary equipment uh, in 1914 to replace the original steam-powered beam engine that was installed in 1853 uh, and at that time served, supplied water to Stockton, Middlesbrough and Yarn. In addition to all of the, the equipment, because the Tees Cottage was such a long way out of the town of Darlington in those days, there was no mains gas supply. So it was also necessary to construct a gas plant to manufacture the producer plant, the producer gas that was required to fuel the engine. And that gas producer plant is housed at the far end of the building uh, on the site where the old 
chimneys to be for the boilers for the original beam engine. The engine itself is a four-stroke internal combustion engine uh, fueled by gas with two horizontal cylinders which are connected together uh, through this massive 14-ton flywheel that you can see uh, alongside me. Um, the cylinders fire alternately uh, and drive a large belt um, which in turn drives shafts for the two sets of pumps that were installed at the same time. The pumps on the left hand side, uh, the so-called river pumps, extract the water out of the river Tees and deliver it to the filter beds in the grounds of the, the cottage and the pumps to the right hand side of the belt are the so-called town pumps which take the clear filtered water out of the storage tanks and supply it to the consumers in Darlington. And despite its size, this engine is rated only at 220 horsepower, which is not much more than a powerful modern car engine. Uh, and that reflects the fact that the producing gas that was used to fuel the engine was of a relatively poor quality because of the large volume of nitrogen uh, that is by nature part of the end product of the producer gas plant. So in order to extract a sufficient power out of the poor gas supply, it was necessary to have very large cylinders large diameter cylinders with a very long stroke. And you can probably see to my left here, these two items are original spare parts. The one lying down on the ground horizontally here is a spare piston, and the cylinder that is standing upright is a cylinder liner in which the piston runs. So you can see the, the size of it because it was necessary to draw in a, a large volume of gas into the cylinder uh, to extract the power necessary to drive the pumps. One interesting feature about the installation <coughs> is the way in which the engine is started. Uh, there were no electric starter motors or starting handles in those days, so the engine is actually started by using compressed air and the cylinder immediately behind me, uh, the north cylinder of the pair, can actually be operated using either compressed air or as an internal combustion engine using the producer gas. So to start the system we have a large air receiver uh, which is filled with air to a pressure of 170 psi and that air is then used to power this northern cylinder and set the whole engine in motion uh, and when it's going sufficiently quickly gas is introduced into the southern cylinder and ignited and takes over control and up driving the equipment, at which point the compressed air is switched off from the north cylinder and under normal operation gas will be introduced into the, norm, the northern cylinder as well so that both uh, engines will be firing and driving the pumps. When we run the engine these days we just use gas in the far cylinder and this northern cylinder, the near cylinder, is simply used to start the system from stationary. The gas engine and its pumps and the ancillary equipment uh, had a service life only of 12 years. They ran continuously from 1914 to 1926 uh, when they were replaced by the electric pumps 
uh, in the buildings at the opposite end of the T Scottish site, the West End. Because in 1926, the increased demand for water uh, and the, the, need, the introduction of newer and faster methods of filtering the water that was extracted from the river and the start of chemically treating water meant that uh, they needed the capacity and power of the electric pumps. So in 1926, this engine became redundant and apart from use for emergency coverage, if there was a problem with the electric pumps themselves, uh, the engine was only ever operated, it, although it was maintained in working order, it was only ever operated for one week a year, just to keep it uh, so that it could be used in, in emergencies. And that situation lasted until 1955, when there was a large explosion in the gas producing plant at the rear of the gas engine house, which prevented all future production of gas. So from 1955, this engine just lay totally idle. So the gas engine lay idle for a best part of 30 years uh, until 1984, when the volunteers had taken over the maintenance and operation of the site and the engine was recommissioned. And it was also at the same time modified so that it could be run on natural gas rather than the original producer gas. Uh, and a mains gas supply was installed to the site. And since that date, the engine has run uh, on every open day since uh, and on several other occasions in between. The engine is really special. Uh, in fact, it is unique. There is nothing like it anywhere else in the world. Uh, not only because, I mean, there were thousands of these machines uh, built in Britain and exported all over the world to drive factory equipment, walk power stations, pumping stations, but none of them survive uh, and none of them in working order. So not only is it just because this engine still operates, but it still operates in its original location. It is surrounded by its original complete installation, all of which still operates, uh, as it was intended to do uh, in 1914. So it is unique. It is the jewel in the crown of the Tees Cottage pumping station, and it's what sets Tees Cottage apart from all the other pumping stations in the country. When I was a lad, these things were all over the place. Um, if ever you wanted steam, be it a, a factory, a coal mine, a steelworks, textile mill, this was the kit that did the job. Very simple, reliable, solid. Yeah. These boilers supplied the steam that runs the beam engine. Running the boiler is quite a complex art, actually. The boiler person, you've got three things to think about. You've got steam, 
you've got water and you've got fire and it's a balancing job keeping all these together. Let's look at the water first. As the beam engine uses steam, the water level in the boiler will drop. And the water level is shown on these side glasses here. We've got half a glass of water at the moment. When the water level drops, we put on the feed pump, which then brings the water level back up. So that keeps the water right. The second thing is the fire. You've got to keep a bright fire. And you do that by the thickness of the fire bed and the amount of air that's going through the fire. Now the amount of air is controlled by the dampers. The wider the damper is open, the brighter the fires burn. But then there's also, where does the air go? And you have two types of air, primary air and secondary air. The primary air goes through the air door here, through the bed of the fire, burns the coal. The secondary air comes in through these doors here and that burns the volatiles and by careful adjustment of the primary air and the secondary air you keep the smoke down. Smoke shows inefficient burning. If you make smoke that's unburned cold and any engine man will tell you smoke does not make steam. Welcome to the blacksmith shop. This building has been part of Tees Cottage pumping station since 1853. Come inside and you'll step back in time to the Victorian era and experience a blacksmith's life. There's nothing quite like it. The loud clang of the hammer on the anvil, the roar of the fire and the hiss of the metal quenching. Inside the smithy is the original 1853 bellows, which provide air to the furnace to increase temperature. The smithy is full of various period tools used by blacksmiths to make and repair items to keep the pumping engines running and to keep the site in good all-round condition. Tees Cottage Pumping Station Preservation Society is now pleased to offer Blacksmith Experience Days. These are available to book for most Wednesdays and second Sundays and are mainly ran by the two volunteer blacksmiths, Steve and Arthur. The courses are hands-on and focuses on the acquisition of basic blacksmithing techniques. The blacksmiths can tailor the day to suit the requirement of each participant. The courses run from 9am to 3pm. After the morning session, during a 30-minute lunch break, the structure of the afternoon session can be discussed and decided to best suit your desires and needs. There are multiple items available to make, such as key rings, fire pokers and bottle openers. Upon completion of your course, you will be issued with a certificate of attendance, which will state that you experienced a day working in a traditional blacksmith shop. This course has been well received and the feedback has been very positive. So what are you waiting for? Book your experience day via the email on screen now. You won't regret it. Oh, that's hot.
The Tees Cottage Miniature Railway is operated by the Stockton and Darlington Model Engineers, formerly known as Cleveland Association of Model Engineers, and was formed in 1977 with one main goal, to promote interest in model engineering. The railway is a 5 inch and 7 quarter inch gauge line, spanning the full length of the site. Departing at Broken Scar Station by the gas engine house, climbing the incline at the blacksmith shop and running past the boiler and beam engine house, turning round at the turntable and stopping at Pier Tree Halt before returning to the gas engine house. The railway operated steam and battery powered locomotives. The line is one of the longest in the northeast. The line is one of the newest additions to the Tees Cottage Pumping Station complex and offers rides on the open days. It's a truly amazing day out. In the tea room we have lots of homemade cakes and we do hot food, uh, bacon and sausage sandwiches and soup and they are very popular, we have people coming back just for the cafe. <laughs> and I'm also producing a cookbook of the cakes and soup that we, the volunteers make and gathered all their recipes together and hopefully that will be available on sale soon. My name is Mary Keneavy. Uh, my name is David Wharton. Hi, I'm Patsy Braithwaite. My name is Martin Brown. I'm George Beautyman. I'm John Moran. It's been a very important part of um, my life and community in a way, being able to convey to visitors how special this remarkable piece of engineering is. 1904, the same date as my house was built actually. It's really good to know that we're helping preserve this wonderful place that um, so many people don't know about. Oh, that's a, that's a hard question because it's all good. Uh, I've, the comradeship, uh, teamwork, the fact that when I first started here I was just I was introduced to the team and I was accepted with open arms. I have no technical qualifications whatsoever. My background is admin and everybody is so willing to explain things. Uh, I'm learning every time I come, I'm learning something new and my technical skills have increased massively. Teas Cottage, it is a privilege uh, to work here and be part of an amazing team of skilled people who enjoy doing largely what they did is in their professional life and did so well and they brought those skills to maintaining this exceptionally special piece of Darlington heritage.
the best thing? Well, for me, um, I'm a, a tinkerer. I've always enjoyed pulling things apart all through my life. And sometimes uh, <laughs> I've managed to put them back together again. Um, this machine, there's always something to do on it. There's always something to oil or clean or adjust or repair. And so it satisfies the engineering side of me. And also, there's great satisfaction. Being an old engine, things go wrong with it. And something might happen that you've never seen before. Yeah. What's happened here? What's going on? And we get our thinking caps on and we all discuss it. And I'll say, you know, you go and look at that and you go and look at that and I'll go and check this. And eventually you put it right and it runs again. And the feeling when you've done that is really great. And of course, you've learned something new. And with a steam engine, you never stop learning. There's always something new. The second reason is the social aspect of the job. We all work well together, we have good times, we go on social visits, we go on outings, um, and we get on very well socially. The third reason is dealing with the visitors. We've met some very interesting people here, we have very good talks with them, uh, we explain things, discuss things, and it's great to see them leaving at night, knowing that you've really made them or helped them to enjoy their day and that's very satisfying as well. So there are several reasons why I enjoy working with you. Hi everyone, Vicky Cairns here, Partnerships Consultant Northumbrian Water Group. I have the privilege of working really closely with the amazing team of volunteers here at Tees Cotch Pumping Station who help us to preserve this beautiful heritage site in Darlington. We're really, really proud of our heritage site and our long-standing partnership with the volunteers. We've been working together for years and years and years. We're also really, really excited to celebrate this site's special anniversary milestone. And I'd like to say a big thank you to the amazing team of volunteers. My message to the volunteers is maintain the good team spirit that we've got. We've got now, help each other. Don't get locked away into particularly small areas we all work together we appreciate we appreciate what to do but bear in mind as well that we're all just volunteers none of us are getting getting paid so we're doing this from our for our spare time much appreciate that all the volunteers are, are putting the effort in from their from their spare time and i hope that they they enjoy it because if they don't enjoy it they won't come again and we rely on the, the volunteers to keep this place ticking away